My special guest today is Professor Peter Teddy, who is a neurosurgeon at uh, Royal Melbourne Hospital and also in private practice here in here in Melbourne. Thank you for your time, Professor. Pleasure. Now you've you've uh, written a, a piece for on uh, neurosurgical intervention for intransigent pain, uh, what the current situation is and how it's changed. Could you tell us a little bit about what neurosurgical intervention looked like in say the the early 80s or the, the late 70s? What was it like then and, and what's changed since? Well, very largely it was so-called ablative surgery, mm -hmm. making lesions in some part of the nervous system, in some part of the pain pathways right. to try and uh, ameliorate pain. The targets could be anywhere from the peripheral nerves right through to the thalamus and to the cortex. These were irreversible operations, mm -hmm. sometimes quite risky, and mainly used, or very often used, in, in treating not uh, non-malignant pain or benign pains, but very largely for the patients with terminal carcinoma. They were generally uncontrolled because it was hard to do controlled studies, if you like, on, on patients with terminal disease, but they appeared to work well. I did a lot myself. And these were seeming, seemingly giving quite good results for the length of time for which the patients survived. Um, there were a lot of problems associated with these conditions. They could get long-term recurrence if they survived that long. Yeah. They could get post-operative dysesthesias, they get phantom pains, and these could be very hard to treat. Then, gradually, over the, over the years, following on the work of Meltzak and Wall and the, and the gate theory in 1967 or 66, a neurosurgeon in the States, Norman Shealy, operated on several patients with terminal uh, cancer, with pelvic and lower limb pains, uh, using spinal cord stimulation. This seemed to be uh, pretty successful in those patients, and so it led to a widespread use of trying spinal cord stimulation, whereby you put a couple of electrodes in those days directly onto the spinal cord mm -hmm. and um, applied a small stimulating current. The idea was to try and swamp the, if you like, the messages going up through the small fibres up through the spinal cord, spinal thalamic tract, and influence the dorsal horns, and to reduce the amount of pain perception and pain being felt by the by the patient, and maybe their attitude towards it. And so this this gave way to a very widespread use of spinal cord stimulation for a whole pile of uh, pathologies that probably weren't appropriate. Mm -hmm. And with the problems that there were in those days, putting electrodes directly onto the spinal cord, there were problems with CSF leaks, infections, many, many technical problems. And the devices themselves weren't particularly um, uh, well developed. Yeah. And then in the 1990s, there was a, a resurgence of the, uh, uh, the technique and the application of this. People learned a bit more when to apply the devices, when what wasn't going to work, what was. The biggest advances were putting the electrodes in the epidural space right. and also the technology improved uh, really pushed along by the cardiologists and uh, with cardiac pacing with similar devices being used mm -hmm. in many ways and so again there was a resurgence then in the, in the 2000s into this kind of treatment not just with spinal cord stimulation but with peripheral nerve stimulation mm -hmm. and perhaps to a lesser extent deep brain stimulation as well the problem is always find, one of finding appropriate targets in the deep in, in, in the brain, yeah. and also again a, appropriate application of this kind of technology. The problem is that the data again still is not uh, conclusive, and the reason for this is that most kinds of stimulators that have been put in produce a paresthesia, right. and so the patients have been able to tell almost all, invariably when the thing is on and when it's off. About 2004, I think it was, um, there was a paper that. Uh, showed a comparison between spinal cord stimulation and repeat surgery in cases of failed back syndrome, mm. failed back surgery syndrome. The results of that did appear to show that there was a good response from spinal cord stimulation. Certainly it was better than reoperating. And there was some evidence as well following on from that to show that there was a, this was a cost-effective or more cost-effective way of dealing with the problem. Mm. The real problem still with all manner of, uh, of um, neuromodulation, which is is that there's never been an effective trial run using placebo-controlled trials or sham-controlled trials against cord or other forms of stimulation. And this has been because of the problem with paresthesia. Yeah. But what's happened now is that in the last couple of years, we've got a better, we have the method, methodology of being able to do that. There have been two recent advances in, in cord stimulation, 
not so much with the gadgetry, but with the, the, the type of stimulation being applied. Okay. One system which has come along uses ultra-high frequency stimulation at mm -hmm. 10,000 hertz instead of at the usual kind of 40 to 200. And this produces paresthesia-free stimulation. And there's another type of stimulation which is applied now, which is a kind of phasic stimulation or burst stimulation, which can have the same kind of effect. So we now have the means of being able to compare uh, cord stimulation versus the conventional, well, the conventional cord stimulation versus uh, high frequency or burst stimulation versus placebo. As yet, no really convincing trials have been done. And so we're still in the same position whereby the whole methodology has never, never yet been fully proved. Oh, I've put in plenty of these things. Yeah. But I still would like to know very much indeed whether these things really have a very genuine major therapeutic effect, effect yeah. or whether they're, they're kind of just marginally beyond placebo. The trial which was most recently carried out uh, did compare high frequency stimulation against another well-known uh, normal stimulation uh, device mm -hmm. and came out very firmly in response of the high frequency stimulation okay. being something like 30% better that both for back and lower limb pains. Mm -hmm. And of course treatment of back pain is the holy grail of, of this kind of treatment but it didn't compare it against a sham and this is what really does need to be done. You mentioned in your paper that uh, there are less than 10 neurosurgeons in Australia and New Zealand who, who specialise in pain. Why is that? Why is it such a small proportion of, of neurosurgeons? I think it's not a glamour uh, okay. uh, specialty. Right. I mean I've done in my career just about everything in neurosurgery that I can do. Mm. And compared to some of the stuff I used to do, aneurysms and uh, intrinsic cord tumours and syringa myelia, it's uh, technically not, not as demanding and, sure. and it's not the kind of thing that the trainees are you know, yearning to go into. It's an interesting it's, it's, it's such a huge problem. It is a huge problem and it needs to be dealt with and I don't think it should be divorced from neurosurgery really mainstream. I think mm. it's far better that any neurosurgeon getting involved does mainstream neurosurgery as well but may have a a very definite specialist interest in it. Is there enough dedicated to it in, in their training? No, I don't think so. Yeah. Not, not at the moment. There's a poor understanding. It takes a long time to get used to some of these patients and you can imagine the clinics are full of people that take a while to get sorted. Yeah. Another of the more recent advances, we think, uh, is that of dorsal root ganglion stimulation, right. which we thought the dorsal root ganglion was a, a kind of passive conduit for, for pain. Yeah. It appears now to have an active function in that. And for things like complex regional pain syndrome or post herniography pain, foot pain, uh, it does appear to be beneficial as far as we can tell, but it's early days. We've only done a few, relatively few of them. What role does patient expectation play in all of this? I think it's huge. I think of the devices I put in, certainly a number that, that appear spectacularly successful, I'm sure in my own mind that they're working from a largely as a placebo. Yeah, but uh, it, not entirely, I don't think. But it, it could be a pretty large proportion, and there is little doubt that the patient's expectations are ramped up by explanation or mm -hmm. inadequate explanation sometimes. Um, and also, putting these devices in, we have a lot of help from uh, industry, mm -hmm. and programmers come along and help us to to work these devices on a, on a uh, longer term basis. And much of the work they do is very very helpful and. and buoy up the patients and keep them going. Yeah. Um, how much of it is actually electrons passing up the, uh, the gadgets and how much of it is, is uh, the input from the psychologists and from the people mm. who are looking out from day to day, I, I'm not, it hasn't yet been determined. Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure.